So in this nugget, I'd like to chat with you about network scanning and some of the objectives and information we might gain from doing direct network scanning. Now, right out of the gate, we want to be aware that when we're doing scanning, we are actively sending packets. And regardless of how we're doing the scans, there's three basic objectives or goals in doing scans. Number one, we're scanning the network looking for live devices. Now those devices could be, for example, servers. Here we have a couple servers in the DMZ. There's an internal server. Here we have a Linux-based computer, a Windows-based computer here. We have a Wi-Fi computer. We have an access point. We have a printer. We've got a switch. We've got routers. We've got firewalls. And it would be ideal to know what the IP addresses are of those devices. If we can fingerprint and identify what the operating system on those devices is, that's great too because that leads us to vulnerabilities or potential vulnerabilities. We'd like to identify the IP address or addresses in use by those devices. And that could include IPv4 addresses and IPv6. And in conjunction with those devices that are active on the network, it would be wonderful to identify the ports that are available or open on those systems. For example, some well-known ports could include things like 80, which is the TCP well-known port for HTTP. And although there's hundreds of well-known ports, some of the more common ones still on the TCP would be 443, which is used by TLS slash SSL. We have port 22, which is used by SSH services. We have port 23, that means they're running Telnet, which is plain text. There's FTP, the control port is 21, and then depending on the flavor of FTP you're using, the data port could be 20. Again, that depends on the type and flavor of FTP that you're using. SMTP is port 25, and the list goes on. On the user datagram protocol, some of the UDP well-known ports would include 53 for DNS and 123, which is network time protocol and others. So for example, if we do a network scan and we identify that there's a machine, let's say this is 192.168.1, and this guy's at 254, and he has port 80 open as well as 443, it's a pretty good bet that that internal server is running web services because it's listening to and responding to our queries regarding those ports. Another objective of our scanning the network would be to identify potential vulnerabilities. So for example, if we know that port 80 is open and then we further determine that it's running a specific flavor, for example, maybe an older version of IIS or a specific version of Apache. And we have methods we can use to discover that. And through that process, if we discover that a specific machine is running a certain version of a web server that does have vulnerabilities, that absolutely could be a potential attack target to compromise the system. I'd like you to imagine that you and I have been given permission and authorization to do ethical hacking and pen testing and vulnerability assessment against this network. One of our first steps in our scanning methodology is going to be looking for live systems, devices that quote unquote really exist either as physical machines or virtual entities on the network. And a very simple mechanism that can be used initially for doing that is simply using the tool of ping. And by using ping, we can send out a ping request to an IP address. And if we get a response, we know that there's a device at that IP address. And if we don't get a response, that means we may or may not have a device. And instead of the attacker having to manually do a ping request to all the IP addresses in a subnet, it's very likely that the attacker is going to use some type of automated tools. And there's lots of tools that can do what's called a ping sweep. And in a ping sweep, we send out a ping request to every IP address. Now, one of the tools is Nmap. Just as an example of how easy it would be to do a sweep of the network, we can have Nmap do it in just a few seconds. And I also should point out that there's multiple ways of doing a sweep. We could do an ICMP echo request and wait for responses. But you know what? If we did that, some device that's been trained, hey, don't respond to an ICMP echo request, may not respond. But do you know what most devices on a network will respond to? They will respond to an address resolution protocol request. And the way that works is if it sends out an ARP request, which is sent out as a broadcast. And in that request, it says, I need to know the layer two address. For the person who owns the IP address of 192.168.1.1, everybody on the subnet hears it, the device who owns that IP address responds, and boom, we got them. We know that that device exists. And again, one of the sneaky ways of doing that is instead of using an ICMP echo request, you can go ahead and use ARP requests. So let's go ahead and bring up a shell, and let's type in nmap. And for most of these commands, you can use a dash dash help and that provides us some documentation on additional options that we can use with it. One of the simple options I'm going to use with Nmap is Nmap space dash SN. What that's going to do, it's going to do a simple sweep of the network, but it's not going to bother going any further into port scans. And we'll put in the network address of 192.168.1.0 slash 24. And that's going to go through and look for all the available IP addresses 
in that network space. And we'll press enter. And Nmap is done. It scanned 256 possible IP addresses, which would include 0 through 255 on that subnet. 0 being the network address space itself, and 255 being the broadcast address. It found 15 hosts and took less than 5 seconds. And there are literally hundreds of tools that we could use for discovering live systems on the network and multiple methods for making those devices reveal themselves. The next step, once we identify live host on the network, is to then go ahead and identify what services or ports are open or available on those systems. And the question may come up, why? Why would we care? Well, if they've got port 80, we know they have some type of web service running. Or if they have port 21, it's probably an FTP service running. And there's lots of different traditional and also not so traditional methods we can use to actually scan for and discover available ports on a system. I admit, it's pretty exciting to identify which hosts are alive and running on a network, but I'll tell you what, it's even more valuable to you and I to know what services are running on those systems. And using port discovery, it can help lead us to understand what those services are. There are three basic benefits of doing port discovery. Number one, if we identify what ports are open or available, that usually indicates the type of service that's available. And the reason that port discovery is fairly easy to do is because if we have a server, let's say we have a server right here, let's call it server one, and then we have Bob, who is sending a packet over to that server. When that packet shows up at server one, it's addressed at layer two if we're on ethernet to the ethernet address of the network card of that server. And the server is going to de-encapsulate that information and pass it up. It's going to pass it up to the network layer where we have IP running. And the server says, oh, that's my IP address. And then the IP header, it talks about what layer four protocol is in the IP header. And if it's an HTTP request, it's going to be using TCP. And if this server is running a web service, it's very likely going to be listening on TCP port 80, which means if we send a request to TCP port 80, the server will respond in predictable ways back to Bob. And that's how Bob, the user, or at least his computer, can know that TCP port 80 is open and available on this web server. And here's the great news. Because these protocols are operating in predictable ways, we can use tools that leverage and take advantage of those basic characteristics. So this is an example of a traditional three-way handshake, the expected behavior when two devices are setting up a TCP session. And very similar to when you're at a party and it's time to say goodbye, we don't want to do a party foul, we want to say goodbye appropriately, TCP also completes its conversations in a certain manner. And the typical TCP termination would go something like this. Bob would send as a TCP flag in the TCP header a fin flag, or the fin flag being set, with a sequence number. The recipient, in this case Lois, would send back an acknowledgement, which effectively says, yes, I received your termination request. It's also going to send an acknowledgement number associated with that acknowledgement. So because Bob's sequence number was 90, Lois is saying I would expect the next sequence number, if there is any, to be 91. Lois is also sending her own sequence number of 207. And then if Lois doesn't have anything further to say, she can also send another TCP segment with the fin flag set as well. She'd use her next sequence number of 208, then Bob, having received that, could acknowledge it, along with acknowledgement 209, which if there was going to be further communications, that would be Lois's next sequence number. And for this segment, Bob is also sending his own sequence number of 91. So his initial one was 90. In the acknowledgement that came from Lois, she's expecting the next one to be 91. So Bob is simply following up the conversation with that sequence number of 91. And voila, this TCP session is now terminated. So in the process of port discovery, we can use the behavior of TCP and other protocols simply to knock on the door. So if the attacker or hacker wants to discover if port 80 is open, he could send a TCP SYN request on port 80, and if we get a SYN act back, bada bing, we know that service is open. Or more specifically, the port is open, which likely leads on the well-known port of 80 to HTTP services. And then the hacker, instead of following that up with an acknowledgement, could send a TCP segment with a reset flag set basically to tell the server, hey, never mind. And that way the hacker can do a scan of ports very, very quickly without tying up a whole bunch of resources. So this graphic indicates a source port of 6783 going to the server's IP address at the well-known port of TCP 80. Now, on the other hand, if the hacker had sent a TCP SYN request to port 80 and got a reset back, it didn't get a SYN ACK coming back, but it simply got a reset, that would indicate that the port is closed. Port 80 on the server is not open. In the TCP header, besides the flags for acknowledgement, synchronization, fin, and reset, there's also a flag for push and urgent. And here's my question for you. What if you and I crafted a TCP packet slash segment, sent it to a server, and we didn't follow the quote unquote rules? For example, maybe we send a fin flag or an urgent flag when we have no established session with that device. See, what that allows us to do is we can leverage the way that some systems respond to wacky packets 
as another method for discovering whether a port is open or not without having to do the three-way handshake. Once we know that a device exists on the network based on a sweep of that network, and then secondly, that it has various ports open, it would be awesome if there was some way of us discovering the actual version of the operating system or the version of the software, like a web service, that they're running. Well, my friend, there are tools to discover exactly that. When we boil it down, there's two basic categories that we have when we're doing fingerprinting of an operating system and or the services that are running, and they are active or passive. And with active fingerprinting, the attacker is directly sending stuff in to the victim and seeing how that victim responds. And that could include normal, for example, three-way handshakes to see what the responses come back like, or perhaps specially crafted packets using hacking tools. So based on even a little nuance on how a specific type of system's protocol stack responds, that information can be used to help identify or at least get closer to the type of operating system or platform that that host is running. With passive fingerprinting, we could either analyze the traffic that's going back and forth between that system and another device. And there are many ways to get that data, including doing some eavesdropping or man in the middle attacks and simply looking at the content. And with banner grabbing, our intent is to see how the device responds and then based on that response, identify what kind of operating system is running and as a result, line up the vulnerabilities that that system might have as a result. And let's bring up a shell and let's run Telnet. And you might be saying, Keith, who are we gonna Telnet to? Well, if we Telnet to a non-standard port, we can get a reaction or response from that system. For example, let's do a Telnet over to 192.168.1.212. But instead of just pressing enter, which would go to the well-known port of 23 for Telnet, Let's put a space and let's add port 80 and press enter. So currently we are connected on port 80 to this server at dot 212. So what we could do here is we could go ahead and put in HTTP commands. For example, let's type in get and I'm going to do it in uppercase space slash space HTTP slash 1.0 and press enter a couple of times. And what it effectively just did was give that get command to the web server who responded to us. So if we scroll up, so this is what I typed in and I pressed enter a couple times. So I got an okay message back from the web server. It also shows me right here, the kind of web server it's running. And that's basically a banner grab. We've just discovered the web server type that's running on that system based on the banner information we just got from it. And if we didn't want to use Telnet, there's other tools that could do a very similar thing. For example, one of those tools is called Netcat. So we could type in NC for Netcat and then type in 192.168.1.212 space and also identify the port of 80 and press enter. And then once again, we can use our get command of get space slash space HTTP slash 1.0, press enter a couple times. And that also feeds us back the same information, including the server type that it's running. We could also use nmap. So to make this a little bit more fun and more graphically entertaining, let's go ahead and use ZenMap for an Nmap demonstration. So we'll type in ZenMap and I'll expand this full screen. So let's just do a quick scan of the network to see what's out there. 192.168.1.0 slash 24. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to add the dash SN just to do a quick ARP based scan of the entire subnet and press enter. And that should take less than about 10 seconds. Great. And it is done. And over here, I've got a question mark on the OS. And that's because the scan we just did did not go far enough into asking what ports were open and or trying to identify the operating system and or the flavors of services like web services that are running on that system. For our example though, we've got this dot 212. And if we wanted more information on that device, we could go ahead and just do a more intense scan of that one IP address. So here we can type in 192.168.1.212. And over here from the drop down for the profile, we could go ahead and do an intense scan. And what I'm going to do also, I'm going to add on to this intent scan, I'm going to add on the dash capital O with a dash capital O, which if it wasn't already baked into that command is also now going to try to discover the operating system of that host. And we could actually run this across the entire network, <laughs> but it would take a long, long time. I just want to demonstrate this on a single host so we can see the results of that. So with that put in, we'll go ahead and press enter, or we could click on scan over here in the upper right hand corner. Either way, we'll launch the scan. And then right here, it indicates by that bar that's moving that the scan is still running. And what we're hoping for when the scan is complete, we're hoping for additional information about this host here, including the operating system. Our scan should also identify the ports open on that device, as well as the type of web server running on port 80. 
So the scan is still running. Down here it's indicating how it's doing and an estimate of how much is left. Through the magic of editing, I'm gonna have this done very, very quickly. And now that it's done, check this out. If we highlight this host, which is 212, over here on the left, it's showing us here the type of web server that's running. It's IIS version 8.5, the supported methods on that web server. And if we scroll down a little bit further, it's showing us from a traceroute perspective how far away that device is. And also the icon over here has changed because it can now identify the type of operating system on that host. Also right here in ZenMap, if we click on the tab called ports slash hosts, it's gonna give us the ports that are involved on that host that are open. There's a tab for host details. So that's how Nmap can be used to do additional discovery of an operating system and or services that are running on top of that operating system. I get to chat about some of the motivators that drive companies and individuals to do both vulnerability management and scanning. If you and I were to do a poll and ask 100 companies why they are doing vulnerability management, including scanning, it's very likely we get an assortment of answers, but it boils down to two root causes why we care. Number one, we want to reduce our risk or reduce our potential for loss. And the second major category is they have to, based on some regulation or legislation that's in place that requires them in the business that they're in to do vulnerability management. And the scanning can help them verify that they're in compliance with those laws and regulations. And the rules are going to vary depending on the type of business a company is in. For example, we have medical, which includes clinics and hospitals, or retail with credit card management and finance, which would include things like banks and investment firms and brokerages and cryptocurrency exchanges and so forth. So the laws and regulations that apply to a company are gonna depend a lot on what type of business that company is doing. One example of some legislation we'd have to be aware of is SOX, which includes new or expanded requirements for all US public company boards, management and public accounting firms. So if a company is required to be SOX compliant, they're gonna to wanna to do vulnerability management to confirm that they are compliant. Another example would be HIPAA, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. So if a company is dealing with medical records and patient information, they'd have to be compliant with all the rules set up in HIPAA regarding protecting that data. And for a company that's doing credit card processing, they're going to have to be compliant with the Payment Card Industry, PCI, Data Security Standard, DSS. Another factor that goes into the mix that may require additional security and additional vulnerability testing is the type or the classification of data that we have. For example, in a company, we might have data labeled confidential or private or proprietary or public. So wherever we have sensitive data, whether it's data that's traveling over the network or being stored somewhere, we need to make sure that we don't have vulnerabilities regarding any of that sensitive or confidential data. And that concept also applies to classification of data, for example, in a government type of environment where we have top secret, secret, confidential, sensitive, but unclassified or unclassified data. And once again, we don't want to have vulnerabilities that would allow an attacker to get access to that sensitive or classified or top secret data. And the question may come up, well, how exactly do we know, <laughs> you know, what we're supposed to be compliant with? And the good news is this, it's really up to the senior management to identify what the regulations are and the requirements are and then provide direction, including what needs to be done, what needs to be complied with, and then periodically get reports to confirm that they're in compliance with whatever requirements they're under. And it wouldn't just be wishful thinking on the part of the senior management team, it would have to be part of the corporate policy regarding what we're gonna do and how we're going to do it. And a big part of that is gonna be training for the employees and the end users so that everybody's aware and can be compliant with the standards that are enforced. A very common method that we're going to use to verify that we're in compliance and we don't have vulnerabilities in certain areas is to use a vulnerability scanning tool. And if we were to do a Google search for vulnerability scanning tools, there's lots and lots and lots of them. Here's a link right here, vulnerability scanners, sec tools, top network security tools. If we click on that link, so here sectools.org is supplying a list of top 125 network security tools. And one of the heavy hitters is right here, Nessus. It's a security scanning tool. And one thing that most commercial vulnerability scanners have in common is the ability to plug into that system. For example, if there's a database looking for a whole laundry list of vulnerabilities that should be added in, that could be not only attached to the vulnerability scanner, but it also could be updated periodically. So we might have a routine in our company that we're gonna scan every 24 hours, and we could write a script that updates any plugins or network vulnerability tests. And that way it has the latest and greatest updates regarding vulnerabilities that it can scan for. And as we scroll down the list, we have others as well. So here's OpenVAS. 
which came from the last free version of Nessus before it became proprietary in 2005. It also has plugins and updates that are available. And there are many effective vulnerability scanners, including those from Rapid7 and SolarWinds and others. Wouldn't it be great if there's some kind of tool that could automatically discover the network as well as identify specific vulnerabilities on systems that it discovers? Well, there are many tools like that. They fall into the category of vulnerability scanning tools. And although there are many different tools we could use, I'd like to demonstrate one of the most popular ones out there, and that is Nessus. A vulnerability scanning application is a double-edged sword, and that's because we can use it, which is great. We can proactively identify weaknesses, whether it's at our firewall or our servers or our systems, because we want to find vulnerabilities and correct them, or at least mitigate those risks, and that's where the double-edged sword comes in. If there's an attacker or a hacker hits using those same types of vulnerability scanning tools against our network, the attacker can discover the weaknesses and vulnerabilities and then take logical steps to exploit those vulnerabilities or weaknesses. And those vulnerabilities and weaknesses could be either due to some inherent flaw or failure in the operating system or application, or it could be a weakness or a misconfiguration of those systems. And one of the most popular vulnerability scanning systems out there is called Nessus. Now, currently I have a scan that I started and it's been running for over an hour. So while that continues to run, let me share with you how we can set up policies for what we want to include in a scan. If we click on the policies tab here and we click on new policy, we can specify the details for what we want to include in our vulnerability scan. Now they have some templates that are already here, but if we wanted to start, for example, with an advanced scan, we could click on advanced scan and I'm gonna call this our custom policy, and then we can go ahead and save it, and we can actually tweak it and configure it, and then use it as a future scan. And then for our custom policy, there's just dozens and dozens and dozens of options that we can select. For example, if we click on discovery, we can specify the host discovery method that we're gonna be using, whether it's ARP or TCP or ICMP or UDP. And under port scanning, we can specify how we want it to be done under service discovery. There are several options here as well. So this tool has lots of ability to be customized based on exactly how we want it to behave in our environment. So once we've set up a policy, we can go back to scans. And if we want to create a new scan, we can click on new scan. And then if we scroll down, there's our custom policy that we just created. We can launch that scan with all of those parameters that we set up as part of that profile. Probably one of the best things to do would be to take a profile that already exists as a template and then start from there to customize a profile that you want to use for your network. So to create a new scan, all we'd need to do is under scans, we click on new scan, select the policy we wanna use, and that scan would start. Now I have a scan that's currently been running for over an hour, and I told it to go ahead and do an advanced scan against the entire network. And hey, it's done, that's great. So about 10 minutes ago, this was still running, and it had been running for at least an hour, and that little check right there indicates that it is now complete. Now to see the details or the results of that scan, we're simply gonna click on the scan itself, it's called test. So we'll click on that, and here's identified that it had found 12 hosts with over 97 vulnerabilities collectively across those. Now, some of those vulnerabilities are informational in nature, that's this blue, and we have the critical in red, and we have some shades in between for high, medium, and low. So this one device at 192.168.1.1, it's got some issues. It's got some red, it's got some orange, it's got some yellow. So it's got 59 issues that are showing up as informational, which are not necessarily risks or vulnerabilities. See the details of those, we can click on that host. So we'll click on that host. And currently it has this column sorted based on critical, high, medium, etc. So if we want to see the details for that, we can simply click on the critical link here. And it will tell us, according to this banner, the remote web server is running a version of OpenSSL that is no longer supported, and blah, 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 blah. It also indicates how we could go ahead and remediate that by upgrading to a version of OpenSSL that is currently supported. So if we wanted to create a report, for example, based on this scan, we could select that scan that's been completed and with it selected over here on the top right, we'll use the drop down for export. So if we want it to be HTML, we can simply click on HTML, executive summary is fine, click on export, and then it downloads that HTML to this local computer. So if we clicked on that, that would go ahead and bring us up the report which is pretty cool because the hyperlinks work in the reports. So if we wanted to go to 192.168.1.1, we could just click on it right here, and it would take us to the details regarding that individual host. It would also give us information on the plugin ID. The plugins are downloaded as part of the Nessus application. So if we clicked on, for example, this plugin ID of 78555, it's gonna give us more details on what that plugin detected, in this case, open SSL being unsupported. And if we scroll down, it'll give us more details regarding that vulnerability.
if we don't have logging or sufficient logging in place, or we don't know where to go to look for that logging, that puts us in an information vacuum where it makes it really tough to troubleshoot. So let's talk for a moment regarding these sources of where we could get logging information. Our computing devices, our workstations could certainly be a point of logging. And that would include the operating systems and applications, including antivirus software, anti-malware software, which could all be generating information regarding what is happening on those systems and how they're communicating with the network. And another big point is that if we have logging functionality on these systems, we also need to make sure that they are enabled so that we can periodically review that. Another source of logging information could be our servers, whether they're internal only servers or servers on the DMZ. So if this server right here was a proxy server and computer two was trying to connect out to the internet to establish a connection, we could look at the logs on that proxy server to see where computer two was going and what ports were used and when those packets were being sent. Another element in our networks that we could use as a source for logging would be our network infrastructure devices, including our switches and our routers and our firewalls. And if we have them in place, if we had network-based intrusion detection systems or intrusion prevention systems, those would also be sources in our network regarding where we could get logging information from. And in many cases, we'll centralize our logging over to a centralized server. And that way we have one location that we could go to to look at and correlate the events of multiple devices. So syslog is an example of a centralized server that we could use to consolidate our syslog messages. Now, one of the challenges with logging is that there can be tons and tons of information that's generated via the logging device. So oftentimes, companies will use automated tools to sort through the log files. And a goal would be to identify indicators or trends that are leading up to something negative or worse that might be happening or could happen in the future. So as we sort through the mounds and mounds of data in log files, we're going to be looking for critical warnings or alerts first, because those are more likely to have a bigger risk if we don't address those to our company and to our infrastructure. And we can often learn the same information from different logs. So let's use these two examples and ask ourselves the question, is there something malicious happening in the system or on the network? And in the output, we have a firewall log file from a server. So that'd be a software firewall that was running on the server. And down below, we have packet captures that could have been implemented either by an intrusion detection or prevention system if it was set up to start capturing data based on a triggered event, or it could be just a protocol analyzer that's showing the data that was captured. So my question regarding these two, take a moment to look at the two examples. Does either one of these, in your opinion, represent potential malicious traffic on the system? So let's start here with the firewall log on the server. All these packets are being received, they're coming in, they're coming in from a bunch of ports that are in order, and they're going to a various number of ports. And I see 1579 here being used twice. It could be doing several probes, I suppose, into each port. This looks to me like a port scan. The host at dot 120 is doing a port scan against the host at dot 100. All of them are TCP based. So unless there's some other authorized device, for example, a scheduled port scan or a scheduled vulnerability scan that's running, that's supposed to be running, short of that, this is indeed malicious traffic. It's a device doing a port scan against the system. So for our second example, and this is from a different point in time on the network, we have all these packets coming in from dot .120 going to dot .100. They're all TCP based. They're all coming from the same source port, and it looks like they're all SYN requests <laughs> going to a variety of other ports. And there's a couple of telltale signs that this is a problem. Number one, in the capture, if the server never responded back to any of those ports, the question would be, why is that host at dot .120 sending SYN requests and trying to establish a three-way handshake on all these different ports? And secondly, if this device at dot .100 doesn't have any of those ports open, there's no valid reason for any device to do a TCP SYN request on any of those ports if they're not in use on that server. And if we have configured our servers to send syslog information over to a centralized syslog server, and if we've configured those servers to include in syslog messages anytime a new port is open, then if there's some malicious software or if an administrator intentionally or accidentally opens a port that shouldn't be opened, by looking at that collective log information over on the syslog server, we could then identify that new ports have been open on that system. And the same is true if a port that was open is disabled. If that gets reported to the syslog server, it's gonna be easier to see just by looking at the syslog server logs. 
And the last piece I'd like to chat with you about regarding logging in general is protection. And you might say, well, Keith, protection of what? <laughs> we want to protect the logs. And mostly we want to protect those from those that are in authority. So if the administrator starts opening up ports on this internal server or closing ports on this server or makes configuration changes or does other things outside of acceptable policy, outside of change control, if that's all logged over to a centralized server, what we want to avoid is that same administrator being able to go to this syslog server and simply deleting those records. So one solution to that is have a separate syslog server that's getting all the data and have a separation of duties. So the person in charge of administering and working with these servers and these systems is not, I repeat, not the same person who has the authority and access to go ahead and manipulate the files on the syslog server. So maybe Bob is the administrator and Lois is the manager administrator of the syslog server itself. And based on human behavior, if Bob knows that everything he does is being logged over to a centralized server that he cannot access, it's very likely that Bob is gonna be more accountable for what he does do with the access that he does have. It was in 1995 where I had my first experience in using a protocol analyzer. It was amazing. We had a client server application that wasn't behaving correctly over the network. And one of the critical tools that we used to solve that problem was a protocol analyzer. So in this We'll take a look at the overall process of how we can capture and analyze the data, and then I'll provide a short demonstration as well. One of our big challenges in using a protocol analyzer is, first of all, how do we get the packets to the protocol analyzer? And there are several techniques that we could use to get the packets so we can analyze them. Number one, we could have a local computer, and on that local computer, we could have the packet capture and analysis software running, and then all the traffic that this computer sees through its network interface card, we could then go ahead and analyze with our protocol analysis tool. But what if we want to capture and look at traffic that's running on computer one? In most corporate networks, we have switches that support the concept of mirroring, where we could mirror or copy all the traffic that goes into or out of a specific port and then copy it over to a management station where we have our protocol analysis software that could then go ahead and look at that data after the fact. Another important question to ask is, how do we capture the packets for multiple devices? And one solution to that is VLANs. If all of these devices, for example, are on the same VLAN, most corporate switches have the ability to do mirroring of all the traffic that goes into or out of a VLAN. So we could once again copy it over to a management computer. And at that point, on the management computer, run the protocol analysis software against those packets. And another possibility is tapping into an existing network. So if we had a network tap, for example, right here on the network, and this is our PCR collection device, we could get copies of all the data going back and forth over this connection from the router to the switch port. So we could then go ahead and analyze it with the protocol analysis software, either at this device or copying that capture to some other location. And then once we have the data, we have the packets, we can go ahead and use a protocol analyzer to dig deep into the details of those packets to see exactly what's going on. So as an example, if we thought that someone was scanning our network or doing some other type of malicious activity, if we used a protocol analyzer, for example, like Wireshark, to take a look at the packets that were going across our network, that would give us an opportunity to go into the details of exactly what's happening. So here in Wireshark, if we click up here in the display filter area and type in ARP and press enter, that display filter will show us from this capture that we're looking at just those packets that are dealing with ARP, Address Resolution Protocol. So as we scroll down through this list, this is some device that's going through the entire network looking for everybody's layer two MAC addresses. It's also very likely this is for the purpose of reconnaissance and discovery of devices that are up and active on the network. So if we continue to scroll down, <laughs> these are all ARP requests. Oh, there's a response. So this packet right here is an ARP reply. And in this reply is the device at 192.168.1.1 whose MAC address is this and it's being responded back to the person who made the request, which is .120. We could also look at the other requests here, and in each of these ARP requests, if we just grab any one of them, here it's showing us that the sender of this ARP request is .120. So the device at the IP address of 192.168.1.120, who has the source MAC address of this right here, is doing all of these ARP requests. And we could do additional display filters as well to zoom in on the traffic that we want to look at. For example, if we wanted to replace ARP with DNS up in the display filter and press enter, this is showing us all of the DNS activity that's part of this capture. So if we grab this one right here, for example, here's the layer two information, which is the ethernet header for the source and destination addresses involved in this DNS request. If we collapse that and go to layer three, here's the layer three header information. If we collapse that and look at layer four, user datagram protocol, the destination port is 53. That's the well-known port for DNS requests. 
And if we collapse that and we expand the payload, the DNS query, and then further expand the query itself, this is looking for a pointer record. And this type of record is used when a device has an IP address and it wants to do a reverse lookup to find out the name behind that IP address. This is also showing us that the response is in packet, in this capture, in packet 545. So if we go to packet 545 right here, here's the response. If we expand the answer, the DNS server at dot 100 is responding back to the person who made the request at dot 120 saying that the name of that host is dc-nug.nuggetlab.com. So here's our game plan for you and I in this lab. After you've launched the lab, we'll go through it step by step. We're first of all going to collect packets and then analyze those packets. And in our network, this is the 192.168.1.0 network. And for this lab, let's go ahead and use the Windows client. And on that Windows client, let's use ZenMap. Let's launch a scan of the network. And at the same time, we'll also run Wireshark so it can capture the packets. And then once we give it a moment to finish the scan, we can use the Wireshark application as a protocol analyzer to analyze those packets that we've captured. So in the hands-on lab, we're going to start off on client-nug, our Windows client. And there's an icon right here on the desktop for Wireshark. We'll go ahead and double click on that to launch it. And with that open, we'll go ahead and double click on Ethernet 1. That's the interface that's connected to our 192.168.1 network. So we'll double click on that to start the capture of packets on that network. And then we'll minimize Wireshark just for a moment. So a packet capture and analysis program like Wireshark isn't too exciting unless we have some packets to actually look at. So let's also, in the interest of generating some traffic, let's go ahead and launch ZenMap right here from the desktop. There's a shortcut for it. And we'll generate some traffic by doing some network scans. So let's double click on this icon right here for ZenMap to launch it. And let's put in the target of 192.168.1.0 slash 24. And instead of doing an intent scan, which may take quite a while from the drop down for the profile, let's select Quick Scan Plus. And as you practice this lab, you're certainly welcome to try any other options you want as well. And with the Quick Scan Plus selected, which is putting in these arguments for Nmap against this network target, we'll go ahead and click on Scan. So while that's scanning, we can go ahead and bring back Wireshark. The icon here is in the taskbar. So we'll open up Wireshark by clicking on that icon in the taskbar. And we can go ahead and maximize that as well. And in the bottom here, it's showing the number of packets that are currently captured. So at this point, at least for mine, I have over 2,000 packets and counting. And let's minimize Wireshark just for a moment. And we'll let the scan completely finish, and it looks like it's done. And if we wanted to look at various ports, for example, we could click on Services and click on HTTP. And this shows us that the host at dot .151 is running HTTP services. And specifically, that port 80 is open on the host 192.168.1.151. It's also showing us the flavor of the web server that's running on that host. So let's go back to our protocol analyzer, Wireshark, by clicking on it here in the taskbar. And then we'll click on the red square to stop the capture. Now, in this output, there are three panes. This top pane right here is the list pane. Then we have the details pane. And then we have the bytes pane. And if we don't want to see all those panes, we can click on view. And then from the drop down, we can select packet bytes, and that will remove the check next to packet bytes so it won't be displayed for us. And that gives us more room for the panes that we do want to see. So this packet capture has 2,500 packets that it captured. As you run this in the hands on lab, you may have more or less, depending on when you click stop regarding collecting additional packets. So let's do some filtering. Up here in the display filter area, let's go ahead and click our mouse in that section and type in ARP. And once we've typed in ARP and pressed enter, it'll show us all of the ARP packets that have been collected as part of the packet capture. So right here in the list view, it's showing us that all these ARP requests are coming from this host at dot .120, which is the IP address of our Windows 10 client machine that we launched the scan from. So as you and I are doing analysis of this packet capture, and we see all these ARP requests to 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and it continues for the entire subnet of 192.168.1, we could tell just from this packet capture that a scan is happening against our network. If we wanted to see HTTP related traffic, we could go ahead and up here in our display filter, remove ARP and type in HTTP instead and press enter. And that will show us only the HTTP related traffic. And what we're looking at right here is a bunch of interactions regarding HTTP between our Windows 10 machine that's doing the scan and our virtual machine that's running HTTP services. Now, most protocol analyzers will have the ability to filter based on certain types of traffic. And in Wireshark, it has some really cool ways to help us build filters. 
For example, if we grab this packet right here, which is HTTP based, it's coming from .120 going to .151, and it's a GET request via HTTP, and down here in the details pane, we can see it's going to the destination port of 80. And let's imagine that we want to see all the traffic that is going to TCP port 80 that's part of this packet capture. We could handcraft a display filter up here, but check this out. We can use the tools in Wireshark to help us build that for us. So to do that, let's expand the TCP header section right here. And then let's select the destination port of 80. We can right click and check this out. From the drop down, we can specify we want to prepare a filter and we can go ahead and specify selected. It'll display, once we activate this display filter, any packets that at layer four TCP that have a destination port exactly equal to 80. So what we can do is go ahead and click this little arrow right here for go or press enter, either way will do it for us. And now what we're looking at is all packets in this packet capture destined to TCP port 80. And if we want to include additional information, for example, let's say we wanted to include the destination IP address of .151, what we could do is find a packet like that. So here's an example, a packet from dot .120 to dot .151. And then with that packet selected, we could expand the IP header information. And down here under destination where it says 192.168.1.151, we could click on that and then right click on that destination IP. From the menu, select prepare a filter and then select and selected. And what that'll do, it'll prepare a filter that says looking for TCP destination port 80 and an IP destination address of 192.168.1.151. And once that's in place, we'll just press enter. And that's now further refined this output for us to show us only traffic that is TCP based going to the well-known port of 80 and includes the destination IP address of 192.168.1.151. And out of that, what this display filter is also telling us right here is that 17 packets out of the 2500 match that. So that's what we're looking at right here in this output. Also, if we wanted to click, for example, on an HTTP packet, here's an HTTP packet between .120 and 151, we could right click on that packet, and then from the drop down, select follow. And then from here, either select TCP stream or HTTP stream to show us more details about that conversation. So let's go ahead and click on TCP stream. And as part of that stream, there's four client packets, 23 server packets, and then it's putting it all into a nice convenient play-by-play -play format for us to look at right here. Then we can scroll down to see all the details regarding that TCP session. If we wanted to see any DNS requests that have been made as part of this packet capture, we could go ahead and type in DNS up in the display filter, press enter, and that's showing us all the DNS related information that are part of this packet capture. So once again, the display filter is here, and then down over here is telling us how many packets, 35 of the 2500 packets are DNS packets, including some reverse lookup requests, and also getting some answers, including information regarding DC NUG, Server 2, and Client NUG. And these DNS requests were created because of the scan that we launched in ZenMap. And that's also the reason why in ZenMap, if we go back to ZenMap and we click on Hosts, that's also the reason why these names are showing up, is because ZenMap did those reverse lookups to get us that information. And if we go back to NMAP output right here, and let's go ahead and maximize ZenMap as well, if we scroll up to the details for dot .151, which is right here, here it's showing us the open ports and where possible the versions that it also discovered that are providing network services on that host. And if we look at the IP address here for that host at dot .151, the reason that it wasn't able to come back and put a name here was because DNS didn't have a pointer record, a reverse lookup record based on 192.168.1.151. And to verify that, once again, we go back to our protocol analysis. So we open up Wireshark again. And from here, with our current DNS display filter still in place, we can just grab a packet where we're doing a standard query for a pointer record and click on that. And then down here in the details pane, and let me go ahead and scooch this up a little bit so we can see it a little bit better. And let's go ahead and collapse the internet protocol. In the payload of the DNS query and expand that further, the type of query that we're looking for is a pointer record. So what we could do if we wanted to specifically look for a pointer record request, we could right click on that. From the menu, select prepare a filter and select and selected. And what that will do, it'll add the DNS and a DNS query type of 12, which is the pointer record. And then press enter. So in this capture right here, we have this packet where we're looking for 192.168.1.151. So in reverse lookup zones, the IP address is done inverted. 
followed by .in-addr.arpa. So this is the host that did the scan asking DNS at .100 if it can go ahead and do a reverse lookup based on this IP address. And based on the details pane right here, it's showing us that the response is in packet 781. So as you do this lab, your packet numbering will differ based on how many packets are in your capture and what the order was when they came in. But if we look here at packet 781, we have a DNS response from the DNS server back to dot 120 saying no such name, which effectively means there's no pointer record for the host at 192.168.1.151 in DNS. So I invite you to play around in this lab environment. Go ahead and do a few additional scans, start and stop the captures, take a look at the packets. And as you practice with Wireshark in the lab environment, you can become more comfortable with protocol capture and protocol analysis using a tool like Wireshark. I'd like you to imagine that you and I have been working on this network and the company that owns that network for several weeks to build a vulnerability management program. And part of that we have in our workflow that we're going to scan the entire network, or at least our critical systems, every 48 hours. And as part of our scanning, we're also going to include physical hosts and also virtual hosts as well. And as part of that, we're going to have the scans run automatically, so we don't have to manually kick it off. So the cool thing about most tools is that we can generate a report manually if we want to, or we can have it done automatically once a scan is completed. And just like Goldilocks and the Three Bears, we don't just have a one-size-fits-all. We have separate reports for individual needs. Case in point, we may have a technical report that goes into the nitty-gritty details regarding what was discovered. While on the other hand, we might also generate an executive report, which is more of a high-level overview with additional graphs and just high-level data that they need to know at that level. We could also have change reports that just identify what changed since the previous scan. Or maybe we have a compliance report that identifies whether or not we're compliant based on the regulations we're supposed to be following, like SOX or HIPAA. We also have reports that can help us identify the direction we're going, or trend reporting. And those reports, in addition to being automatically generated, we could also have them automatically distributed, such as being emailed to the appropriate party so they can have access and view that report. Now, a big piece of having a report is having someone look at or analyze that report. So let's imagine that we have a report and it identified overall that there's 5,000 vulnerabilities. And the question comes up, well, which ones do we deal with first? And the answer would be twofold. Number one, we definitely want to take care of anything that's critical. And part of that's going to be a factor of how bad is the vulnerability and also what type of system has that vulnerability. Or perhaps we look at the report and it shows us that we have a connection from a server to an IP address that exists in a foreign country. And after looking more at the details of that, we see that there's been hundreds of megabytes sent from that server to that remote IP address. And it's very likely something like that would be a very high priority that we want to fix right away. So when dealing with remediation or correcting the problem, the tendency is let's go fix it right now. Go, go, go. And we do want to fix it correctly, but check this out. Not every challenge, not every problem can be fixed immediately. So regarding the question of why we can't just rush in and fix all the issues immediately, it could be just because there's too many of them, too many problems. So we prioritize, and maybe we have like 10 or 15 that we want to focus on that are the most critical. We want to take care of those first. But even with those, we may not be able to just rush in and get those fixed right away. Now, one of the challenges about rushing in and putting in the corrective actions right away is what if the corrective action is going to need to take down the network or cause some loss of functionality for a period of time? If that's the case, if we have SLAs in place, service level agreements, or if we have a less formal agreement in place with the customer, such as an MOU, that's a memo of understanding, we need to consider that as we weigh the severity and the possible impact of the vulnerability based on our agreements with our customers. So we want to be concerned anytime there's a possible business interruption of service and consider that in the overall picture as we implement solutions. Another item that can slow many organizations down in implementing a solution or a corrective action is the red tape that's involved or organizational governance. Here's an example. If there's some change that needs to happen in the network, it's going to be team one that is going to identify and write out the configuration change that needs to happen and then team two sets up the permissions so that those changes can be implemented. And then team three actually does the implementation that team one recommended now that they have the permissions that team two set up. And if that's how the change control is set up, that process may take a week or more to implement. 
another item that we want to be concerned with is not to degrade functionality. So if the company needs functions A, B, C, and D in their systems, and our remediation blocks out or prevents you know, function C or function D, that's not going to fly because we can't degrade functionality or take away services or functions that are needed by the business. Before we go to change control and we give a recommended course of action, we'd want to take the steps and test our changes first in a test environment, a practice environment. And that same concept is true if we're looking at or analyzing software that we think may be malicious by putting it into a logical sandbox where we can watch everything that system is doing and everything that application is doing. For example, what network calls is it making? What is it reading and writing to from the file system? By having a test environment, including the ability to do sandboxing, we can only observe applications and systems and configurations. We can make sure that the corrective action or the decisions that we're making have been thoroughly tested before they get implemented on the production network. And once we're confident with what the corrective action should be, we're going to submit that request through the change control process, which is going to involve some authorization and some time frames. And as part of that, they're also going to want to know what is our backout process in the event the change doesn't go well. And that'll all get signed off on, we'll implement the changes, we'll document what we did, and move forward. And one of the benefits of getting ahead of the curve and doing ongoing scanning before we have a major security event is that we can get a heads up on many things that we can fix and correct before those vulnerabilities cause a significant loss to the company. In this hands-on virtual lab, we're going to do three basic things. Number one, we're going to use Nmap to identify hosts on a network. Secondly, identify what open ports are on those hosts. And third, use Nmap to go even deeper to identify the operating system that's running on those hosts. So take a moment right now and launch the hands-on lab. If you're on a computer, it's over on the right-hand side. And let's begin. One of the most popular network scanning tools, which also, by the way, is free and very, very effective, is a little tool called Nmap. And the question may come up, well, when exactly would we use it? Well, let's imagine a scenario where we've secured our network and our management comes up to us and says, how do we know? How do we know it's secure? Well, one of our options is we could hire an outside contractor to come in and do penetration testing, or pen testing for short. And if we do hire a third party that is authorized to come in and start looking for vulnerabilities and looking for weaknesses and seeing if they can compromise the system, we'd also want to make sure we have an SOW. That's a statement of work. It's going to make sure that the pen testing company or individual who's coming in is going to be abiding by the rules that we give them. Maybe we say no social engineering of any type as part of this pen testing. Or maybe we say these five servers are off limits. Do not touch them as part of your pen testing. So from the pen tester's perspective, the statement of work would also include the rules of engagement regarding what they're allowed to do and not do. And as part of the pen testing, it's very likely that that company is going to be using the tool of Nmap for the reconnaissance and discovery on our systems. Another option is we could internally do games, like war games, except for computer security. We could have a red team, which is the offensive side. That's the hackers and attackers trying to compromise systems. And the blue team would represent the security team, the people who are in charge of defending the network and making sure it's secure. And in the process of playing these war games regarding security on our networks and systems, we'd also want to have very clear rules. For example, if something is discovered, it can be reported, but not really taken advantage of. Case in point, if the red team discovers that there's a vulnerability on one of our servers and they can implement a denial of service attack, we certainly don't want that denial of service to happen against a production system. So in a scenario where we're doing red team, blue team exercises, it's very likely that the red team is also doing scanning and very likely using Nmap for a big portion of that scanning. We've got five systems in the virtual lab environment. We have a couple of Windows servers right here. We have a Kali Linux, which has a huge tool set that we could leverage. We've got a Windows client. And I've also got a virtual machine in the lab environment that represents the OWASP BWA. OWASP is an acronym representing the Open Web Application Security Project. And BWA is the Broken Web Application Project. So it's a special virtualized machine <laughs> that has lots and lots of problems, which in a lab environment is a tremendous resource if you want to practice looking at and becoming more aware of vulnerabilities in a system or an application. So here's what we're going to do. If you haven't done so already, if you're on a computer, go ahead and launch the lab to bring it up. That doesn't take very long to initialize everything. And once it's up, we'll use Nmap to first of all scan the network for individual hosts. And then we'll take it a step further and we'll look for ports that are open and listening on those systems. 
And then we'll kick it up that much more by taking a look and see if we can determine the exact operating systems and or application information that's running on those hosts. And we'll use Nmap to discover all of that. So here on our Windows client machine, its name is client-nug. I've already installed Nmap and there's also a graphical user interface counterpart to Nmap called ZenMap. And I have both of those available for us on this virtual machine. So what I'd encourage you to do is follow along with me, pause the video as you do the hands-on practice yourself. And the cool thing about the virtual lab environment, anytime you want to practice it, you can just launch that lab and practice it again. So here on the Windows client machine, let's bring up a command prompt. And we can do that by right clicking on this Windows icon here in the bottom left hand corner. And then from the menu, you can just go ahead and click on command prompt. And that'll open a command prompt for us right here on the Windows client machine. And I'm going to go ahead and use the maximize button to maximize that full screen. And one of the first things I like to point out is that if we just type in nmap, N-M-A-P, and press enter, it's going to give us a huge, huge list of the options that we can use in conjunction with nmap. So as an example, we'll type in nmap and without any other arguments added after it, we'll simply press enter. So if we scroll up a little bit in this output, we can take a look at the various and large quantity of options that are available in conjunction with the nmap utility. And there's various options for host discovery and the methods that we're going to use for scanning and options for scanning and discovering specific ports that may be open and also options specific to service or version detection of a host running an application or a service. And one of the options here under host discovery is dash SN, which they call a ping scan, which is a scan that's not going to include looking for individual ports that might be open. So in the lab, let's do a quick scan of the network using the dash SN option. So to do that, we'll type in nmap, nmap space dash, lowercase s, lowercase n, space, and then we would specify the target of what we want to apply this scan to. We could specify a single host, either by IP address or name, if DNS was operating, or we could specify a network, and we could also include things like lists of networks. For our demonstration here in the lab, let's do a scan of the entire 192.168.1 network, where all five hosts are in our lab environment. So that network is 192.168.1.0 slash 24. And that will perform a scan without doing port discovery for the entire 192.168.1 network. So with that supplied, we'll press enter and let it run. Now, as it's running, if we press enter a few times, it gives us status updates because sometimes a scan may take quite a while. So if we launch a scan, which we did right here, and the prompt is just sitting there while the scan is running by pressing the return key, by pressing enter, which I did twice, it currently tells us the current scan that's in place and also the approximate amount of time remaining. So if we have a scan that's taking five to 10 minutes, by pressing enter, it can give us that update that it's currently in progress. And then as a result, it found the following devices. It found a device at dot one. It found a device at dot 100, dot 102, dot 109, dot 151, and dot 120. And that happens to be the five virtual machines that we have in our lab environment, in addition to the default gateway at dot one. It also shows us the layer two addresses of each of those devices. And based on the first six characters of those layer two MAC addresses, it's also showing us the vendor. And currently this entire virtual lab environment that we're using is in Hyper-V. And that's why it's indicating Microsoft for each of these hosts that it found based on the layer two MAC address on the network interface cards. Nmap also did us the courtesy of doing a reverse lookup in DNS. So it found out there's a host at dot 100. It made a DNS reverse lookup request effectively looking for a pointer record, and then got the information back regarding the host name. So dc-nug, server2-nug. The devices dot .109 and dot .151 don't have pointer records in DNS. That's why they didn't come back with names. And then down here at dot .120, we have our client nug machine. That's the current machine that we're sitting on. Now, over 30 years ago, we didn't have options for a graphical user interface for a lot of the tools. Most of it was at the command line. However, with Nmap and a lot of other tools, there are graphical user interface counterparts that go along with them. In the case of Nmap, there's a graphical user interface for Nmap called ZenMap. Let me show you that. Let's go ahead and close this command prompt. And here on the desktop, I've got an icon for ZenMap, Z-E-N-M-A-P. Let's go ahead and launch this over here on the left-hand side of our Windows client computer. And let's go ahead and expand that full screen as well. So if we wanted to do that same scan again, but use the graphical user interface of ZenMap, what we would do for the target, we'd specify our target. Let's go ahead and put in 192.168.1.0 slash 24, press enter. And then for the profile, there's a whole bunch of pre-built profiles regarding the types of scans that we want to do. 
So if we use the drop down here in the profile section in ZenMap, and then we go down to ping scan, we simply click on it, notice what it did right over here. Right here under the command, it's going to use the command nmap space dash sn, which is a basic ping scan, and then it's going to use the 192.168.1.0 slash 24 as the target. So if we want to run this scan, all we do here in ZenMap is simply go ahead and click on the scan button in the upper right hand corner, click on scan, and that runs. And that'll just take a few seconds, and it'll give us the same results that the nmap did from the command line. And for readability, I'm going to go ahead and drag this over a little bit so it's a little bit easier to see both sides. So here are our five machines once again that we discovered via the scan, and there's our default gateway at dot one. Now, in reality, when we're scanning a network, we're not just looking for devices that are up. We also want to know what ports that are open on those devices, and then furthermore, what services are available on those systems, and when possible, what operating systems and versions and flavors of apps are running on those systems behind those open ports. And to discover more information on the open ports and services, we could use nmap from the command line with the correct arguments. We could also just as easily use zenmap, which will build the commands in for us. So case in point, check this out. If we wanted to learn more information about dcnug, for example, we could change our target to be dcnug. So instead of scanning the whole network, we could go ahead and scan just .100. So now our target is 192.168.1.100. And to do a more thorough scan, we can just go over here to the profile, and from the dropdown, we can select a more intense profile. An argument, effectively, that's going to do more looking and more asking by sending more traffic over to that host and then paying attention to the results that come back. So for example, if we did a quick scan plus, select that from the dropdown for the profile, notice what it did over here on the left-hand side. Over here now, it's going to be running nmap against that target, and it's going to be using these options, dash sv, dash t4, dash o, dash f. There's also some built-in scripts that are part of nmap, and then that's the target. And because there's so many options with nmap as far as arguments that we can use, knowing that we can just type in nmap and execute it at the command line, it will show us all those arguments and what they do is helpful. And for the purposes of our lab right now, let me just highlight what these options are doing for us right now. The SV is for version scanning. So when possible, it'll return the version of the system that's being scanned. The dash capital T is for timing, and 4 is representing aggressive. And for timing, the ranges are 0 through 5. So the higher you go, the more aggressive timing-wise the scan is going to happen. So if an attacker wanted to avoid detection by an intrusion prevention or detection system, if they use a timing of 0 or 1, the intent is by the attacker, by having the scan happen so slowly, that the timeout on the IPS or IDS may not see it as a scan of that system. The negative is, it's going to take longer for that scan to complete. So T4 is fairly aggressive from a timing perspective. The dash capital O represents that we want to attempt OS detection to determine what the operating system is running on the target. And the dash capital F is the fast option, which is going to cause it to scan only for the top 100 most common ports, as opposed to the top 1000 most popular ports. And the dash dash version dash light makes the version scanning much faster. And as a result of it being faster, the downside is it's slightly less likely to identify services that are running on that system. So with those all in place, we'll go ahead and click on the scan button once again, and that'll go ahead and run that scan. So after a few seconds, it says it's done. Took a little bit over 11 seconds to complete. Here are the open ports that it discovered. It identified that it's running Microsoft Windows Server 2016, and under OS details, it specifies that it's build 10.586 of Windows Server 2016. And if we want to do even a further scan of this host, we could do it by simply changing the scan. So our target is still dot .100, and under Profile, if we use the down arrow here, and we select Intense Scan plus UDP and click on that, it swaps out some of the arguments that we had previously, and then we'll go ahead and click on Scan. And through the magic of editing, I've sped up the actual scan so we don't have to wait the full amount of time that the literal scan took. So as you do this in the lab, just be aware that this scan may take a few minutes to complete. And while that scan is running, right here it shows us that the scan is currently in place. So when you do this in the live environment in the lab, this little icon will be moving to indicate there's activity. We can also click here on the Scans tab, and it will show us the scans that we've done in the past which are these two scans that we just did a few moments ago, and the current running scan, which is this bad boy right there. So if we go back to the Nmap Output tab, it still has quite a ways to go. So while that's continuing to run, let's go ahead and take a look at the other tabs regarding this host, DC-NUG. So we'll click on DC-NUG here on the left, and then we'll click on Ports slash Hosts. And it's showing us here on DC-NUG that these are all the open ports. 
that it's discovered so far. And we're also likely to have a few more that are going to show up as a result of our more intensive scan that's currently running. Here on the Topology tab, it's going to show us the topology. So currently, everything is sitting on the 192.168.1 network. So there's no hops involved, there's no routers being crossed, it's all local. So there's some limited tools here to take a look at the topology of the devices that we've discovered. And if we click on host details regarding this host, it's showing that based on the scans that it's already completed, that there's six open ports out of the 100 that it scanned that was in our original scan. There's 94 of those ports that are closed. Here's an icon that represents it's a Windows system. And down here under the operating system, it's specifying the build number for it. We could also scroll down, and I would encourage you in the lab environment to go ahead and scroll down and click on the plus symbols next to the additional information for more details and information about what Nmap found. So if we go back to Nmap output, through the magic of editing, we're going to come back at the point where the scan is completely done regarding this host. Now, as part of this scan, I have a Windows pop-up saying, Windows firewall is blocked, some features of this app. And I'm going to go ahead and say, allow Nmap to communicate on domain networks, private networks, and public networks by putting checks in all the boxes and clicking allow access. And that scan, this intense scan plus UDP on that host, <laughs> that took a long, long time. So as you do this lab, if you don't want to wait the entire time for that to finish, you can go ahead and choose maybe a less intensive scan. So from the drop down here, still with 192.168.1.100 selected, let's go ahead and do a quick scan plus, and let's go ahead and launch that. So we'll go ahead and with the quick scan plus selected, just for the interest of time, and when you actually do this, let's go ahead and click on scan. Also, if there's a scan that's running and you want to cancel it, you can just go to the scans tab right here and select the scan that's currently running, and then down below you can simply say cancel scan. Now we don't have to wait for it to finish. So in this case, that scan is currently done. So if we go back to Nmap output, here is showing us the scan that was used to get these results. So with this scan, it just took 10 seconds to run. And if we take a look at the longer scans from the drop down, it gives us a list of all the scans that we've run. So if we grab this one that took a longer time to run and got us more detail, it'll show us the output here. So regarding this scan that I did that took quite a bit longer to do, but it was much more thorough, if we scroll down to the output here, here it has a much longer list of open ports it found because it did a more thorough scan. So as we look at this, either from the red team perspective, the attacker perspective, or the blue team, which is the security team perspective, if we saw ports like this, 389, that are open, that's a well-known port for LDAP, Lightweight Directory Access Protocol. And 389 is not encrypted. And because it's not encrypted, if we're actually using LDAP on port 389, that's a vulnerability that a hacker, now that he's aware of it, to start listening for to try to gain access or credential information regarding access to or information from our LDAP server. I also know this port 636, which is the TLS flavor, the secured flavor, if you will, for LDAP access. In addition, we have port 53, which is a well-known port for DNS, which would imply that this is a DNS server. We also have port 123, which is open, which is a well-known port for network time protocol. So the fact that we know this is a Windows server, the fact that we know it's running Active Directory based on this output. However, it's not running traditional web services on the well-known port. If it were, we'd have port 80 and port 443 for HTTP and HTTPS respectively. And because they're not showing as open here, we can infer that here on DC Nug, it is not running web services, at least not on standard ports. So here in the lab environment, whether you want to play with Nmap at the command line or use this graphical user interface, either way is great. I would encourage you to have the first three octets always be 192.168.1 something, either the entire network or you can scan for a specific host. But we want to keep all of our scans local inside of this lab environment and not go outside of that network. And while we're on that note, I would encourage you to never do active scanning on a network unless you personally own it and have authorization to do it or you have written permission by those in authority saying that it's okay to scan their network. It was back in the 1990s, like 95, 96, when I really appreciated what the benefit of a baseline is. When we identify what's normal, what's expected, and then, as things start to go beyond or outside of those boundaries of the baseline, we want to have alerts and notifications so we can act and take care of those issues and problems. <laughs> and I was going for my pen on my tablet and it wasn't working, so I had to unplug and replug in my USB connector for the monitor. Sorry about that. So getting back to the topic of leveraging and using baselines. Some of those baselines could be regarding security. For example, we may have a baseline for the configuration of network devices, like switches and routers and firewalls, to harden them and make them more resilient 
and less vulnerable to common types of attacks. We also may have a baseline regarding configurations on a computer and a server, including configurations of the software firewall that may be running on those systems, or the antivirus or anti-malware software, or the types of user permissions that a user can have when they're using those computers. And whenever there's a change regarding anything in our systems, we want to make sure we're considering security and also considering change control. So if there's a new patch for one of our systems, we should have a patch management program that helps us to identify that patch that it's out, then to go ahead and test it in a test environment, non-production, to verify that the patch does its intended purpose and also that it's not causing new security problems. And then with change control and documented rollback procedures, in case something doesn't go well, we then go ahead and implement the patches and updates and then do really good documentation regarding what's been done. And it's very likely that if the next day there's a problem or a new situation, it's a very good possibility that it's tied somehow to the changes or updates that were just done. So that's once again a good reason to have a rollback procedure or process so that we could roll back the changes if we need to, to get back to a point where we were before we made the changes in the first place. Another important aspect of having baselines and finding out what normal looks like is regarding our network traffic and how our network devices are behaving. And a big part of that is to gather the metrics that are feeding us information and documenting what quote unquote normal looks like. So we want to have metrics and baselines regarding error rates or utilization or packet drops or how much bandwidth is being used and what the throughput is. And that way, when we show up to either troubleshoot or make a change on the network, if we have the metrics, we can compare from before we make a change and then after we make the change to have the metrics in place and that feedback available so we can verify if there's still a problem or a significant degradation in the network functionality because of what we did or because of the problem that we're working on. And it's also a terrific idea to get ahead of a problem or to at least learn about a problem or situation as early as possible. Because as my mom used to say, and I don't think she made this statement up, but she used to say, a stitch in time saves nine. So if we can get to a problem earlier, we can help prevent a further loss or a further disruption of service as time goes on. So generating alerts and having an event management system is a big part of that because we want those notifications and alerts. A lot of companies have a SIM, Security Information and Events Management System, that can take log messages and alerts from multiple systems, from firewalls and switches and routers and servers, and help us sift through all that information to find out what the really important messages are so we can focus on those tasks first. And in addition to log messages as part of a SIM, we could also have simple network management protocol with their management information bases, MIBs, that are sending trap information and notifications over to a centralized server that can help us become aware of things like utilization and packet drops and other events as early as possible to give us an advantage of time to get into and start working with the problem to correct it. Thanks for watching our second and press the button below, like, subscribe, and bell icon.